Me live on the mic over there. All right, everybody that's downstairs, please come up. We're starting services. <laughs> What's that? Hear ye, hear ye. least one more. <laughs> Everybody's still filing in, so I'm going to give it another 30 seconds or so. <laughs> We're starting right on one, huh? <laughs> one and a two and a. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's all right. Years ago, it used to be almost ten. 15 minutes, <laughs> and we get to that. Before we started streaming, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Well, otherwise it'd be just me singing. <laughs> no, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that. <laughs> What's that? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> He's here. The birthday boy, happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath to you. Happy Sabbath to everyone on the webcast. Well, if you grab your hymnals, brethren, we'll start out by singing praises to God. Let's turn over to page 181. We'll be in the Burgundy book, and we will sing His Mercy Never Fails. Page 181.
you so much, brethren. For our second hymn, let's turn forward to page 204, and we will sing, Thee Will I Love, O Lord, page 204. Thank you, brethren. For our third hymn, let's turn back to page 162, and we will sing The Mercy That Never Fails, page 162, and after which I'd like to ask Mr. Steve Frenchick to open with prayer.
Thank you, brother. Now for the opening prayer. Uh, Eternal Father, our great almighty God, Father, we gather here on your Sabbath day and just thank you for calling us out of this world, opening in our eyes, Father, that we are all on the same journey, want to be in your family, Father, and be there when that resurrection happens. And we ask you now as the Passover comes close to really help us examine ourselves and look at ourselves and try to find the fault we have in us because we know we are all sinners and we depend so much on this Passover, this sacrifice that our Savior made for us to forgive our sins and give us the opportunity to be in your family. So, Father, we just put this service in your hands, ask you to inspire the speaking and the hearing and help us to be an example and a light to this world. We thank you again so much, and in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Steve. Boy, we've got quite a crowd here today. It's great. I'll tell you, when you start singing those pre unleavened bread songs, pre Passover songs, and there's so many voices out here, that last one I had goosebumps. <laughs> I mean, it was great. Thank you so much, brother. All right, brother, and I do want to start with some announcements, uh, and then we'll, we'll scoot into some prayer requests, have another hymn. And then in the main message. So starting off with announcements. Uh, Passover uh, this year will be conducted Sunday evening after sunset on April 21st. Please arrive about 15 minutes before sunset. Also, Passover will be webcasted uh, over the internet too as well. Night to be observed will be held here at the church building this year Monday evening, April 22nd, appetizers at 7 p.m. Dinner will be served at 8.15. Uh, the suggested donation is uh, $30 per person. Please mark your checks. I'm assuming in the little note box there, NTBO, night to be observed. If, uh, if you'd like an adult beverage with dinner, uh, you're welcome to bring your own, uh, your own bottle uh, of your choice. Also, please don't forget to bring appetizers and a dessert and or a dessert uh, to enhance uh, our evening dinner uh, for uh, April 22nd. That'll be Monday evening for the night to be observed. First day of unleavened bread will be conducted at 1 p.m. That's Tuesday, April 23rd. That way we get a couple more hours of sleep. 1 p.m. Uh, and we will take up an offering, and that will also be webcasted. Then the last day of unleavened bread will be conducted on April 29th. I do believe that's a Monday. And uh, that's at 11 a.m., our regular time. Uh, also, an offering will be taken up and... Those services will also be webcasted, so I'm sure we'll repeat this every week until we get there, which isn't too far off. <laughs> if you want, I guess we have a bulletin downstairs uh, that you can grab by the TV as well that shows you, shows you everything. There will also be a Bible study uh, scheduled for April 6th, that's next Sabbath, after services. Those of you that... Uh, we'll be staying or uh, encouraged to bring a, like an appetizer or dessert or a beverage if you like. Uh, no adult beverages for that one. Uh, please, uh, there'll be pizza, there'll be coffee, there'll be tea. That'll be provided. But uh, if you could bring an appetizer or dessert or, or whatever soft beverage you would like. Uh, we will be continuing in the book of Galatians and picking up in chapter 5. That was next Sabbath, April 6th. And then uh, Harain Smith, who is uh, the CGI pastor of Toronto, Canada, he'll be visiting here on April 20th, right before Passover, so mark your calendars for that. Boy, I haven't seen him in a while. Uh, it's going to be really good to see Harain. So Harain Smith will be here on April 20th. Uh, this week's Armor of God is a very interesting program titled Why Jesus. You can check it out at cgi.org. All right, that's all the announcements that I have. So let's scoot over into some uh, uh, prayer requests. Uh, 
Um, this one is from Sadia Duplache, Jane and, or Jan and Naomi Clark, and Donnie and Crystal Furman. I'll start that again, just so if you're taking notes. Jane and no, Naomi Clark, and Donnie and Crystal Furman wanted to thank everyone for their prayers. The kidney transplant went very well. Naomi was released from the hospital on Friday. Uh, Donnie was released Friday as well, but will be staying at the Brent Hotel for at least three weeks to make sure that his body does not reject the kidney. Continued prayers are appreciated, and thank you for all your prayers that you, that you have given on behalf of them. This next one, uh, the Hendricks family would like to ask for your prayers due to a recent challenge that they have been con uh, concerning their oldest son, Jason. Uh, Jason has been challenged with personal issues that may result in some very serious long-term life-changing events. The circumstances are quite complex and very serious, but the situation does remain hopeful. Please keep Jason and their family in your prayers, including the grandparents in your prayers, appealing to God that he will work out the circumstances in Jason's favor. That's for the Hendricks family. We have an update on George Panelinas, a longtime member of CGI Medina congregation. Uh, he had that very tragic event occurred to him and his wife a couple weeks ago. He had he and his wife were came home from shopping only to experience that their car burst into flames in the garage. This resulted in a complete burning of the house down. God be praised, God be praised. Everyone got out of the house without being hurt. But the damage according to the appraisers is a total loss. However, George and his wife are making progress and beginning to get things back in order as best as they can for now. They wanted to thank everyone for their prayers, texts, phone calls, but to please continue because it's very encouraging. It will be a long road before anything is back to normal. So please keep the Panelinas family, George and his wife, in your prayers uh, as they go through this, this tragedy. Thank God and praise God that they're okay. Update, please remember to keep Wendy Hendricks in your prayers uh, as she continues to do her protocols to fight against cancer uh, that she was diagnosed with. So please keep Wendy and her husband Steve in your prayers as well. Also an update, uh, remember to keep Carly Burgett in your prayers as she continues to fight with cancer also. She remains at home doing the best she can to continue to do what she is able to maintain her current health. Please keep her in your prayers. Phone calls are welcome as well as her husband John too. Update also on Rose Spithaler. Uh, please keep her in your prayers as well as she continues in therapy, recovering from the stroke that she had some months ago. Rose and Frank miss everyone and hope to attend uh, some of the spring holy days. Please pray that that can be possible. That's for Rose Spithaler. Uh, brethren, that's all the prayer requests I have at this time. Just remind everybody of our prayer board downstairs and our website. Um, just thank everyone for your continued prayers. If if everyone would rise, we'll go before God and ask for his intervention. Almighty, eternal Father in heaven, Father, we humbly come before your throne, Father, thanking you and praising you for every single blessing in our lives. Father, we praise you for this Sabbath day to be able to come together as a family and worship you. Thank you for this place that you've provided and all your blessings. Father, we need you every moment, every hour, Father. Reading off all these prayer requests, Father, uh, there's so many people out there that are battling. I mean, it was just cancer and cancer over and over again. We see, we see stroke and, and people that uh, are battling all kinds of different personal problems that run so deep that affect so many families, Father. I'm all the way down to homes being lost. 
Father, we praise you for, for the safety that you provide, especially like with George and that. We also praise you for the, the healing that you've provided when we read off those prayer requests from Sadia, Father. And we continue to beseech you and ask for your intervention on behalf of those that are continually needing your healing, your encouragement, uh, your loving kindness, Father. So we submit them all into your hands, thanking you and praising you and giving you all the praise, all the credit, all the reverence, Father, all the power and glory is yours. And we just submit this prayer into your hands and all these people and ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. It is in his holy and righteous name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll have another song. And then we'll get into the main message. So if everybody would turn over to page 207. I gotta turn over. There. Let's see. We will sing Not Many Wise Men Now Are Called, page 207. Thank you so much, brethren. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce today for the main message, Mr. Mike James. Good to go. Okay, very good, very good. Just checking my time there. Good to be back here in Ohio, see all the familiar faces. Uh, I went through Seattle this time, so I always have interesting uh, experience getting here. And I went through Seattle. Usually when I get to Seattle, it's raining or cloudy, things like that. But I was sunshine yesterday. And then I look out today, and it's, it's cloudy and gloomy here today. But you guys are brightening everything up as I look out at the smiling faces here. So it's good to be back in Ohio. And uh, we'll be doing some programs tomorrow with Bill and John and the, the crew. Are you going to be there tomorrow? Or, okay, very good. Okay, thank you. So um, what I'm going to do today, a little bit different message this is more of a lecture type message and the reason for that is because of the subject matter and uh, we're going to be talking about the book of First Enoch. Now don't get scared Bill, okay? <laughs> I'm not promoting the book of First Enoch because it's not in our Bible folks and it's not in our Bible for very good reason. Now you might wonder, well why are you talking about it then Mike? Well, here's why I'm talking about it. 
as I listen to people in the church, as I check out the internet and see what's happening there, I'm seeing not only in the church of God, let me, let me tell you, people in the church of God are getting into the book of Enoch, people in the Hebrew Roots Movement, which is very similar in beliefs to us, are getting into the book of Enoch, and so is the regular Christian world getting into this first book of Enoch, there's a second book of Enoch, and there's even a third book of Enoch. And I want to address it because I want to just familiarize you with this material a little bit because of the fact it's not Scripture. And what concerns me is I'm aware of an independent Church of God group that is now using a calendar that you find within the books of Enoch, okay? And uh, there are different ideas that are out there that are percolating up in mainline Christianity and even within the Church of God movement, that's my concern, okay, that are getting into some ideas that are in the book of Enoch. So I want to dispel the concept that this might be Scripture. Uh, I don't believe it is Scripture, and for good reason, and hopefully uh, you will become aware of that today. Now, I will say this. You will find some things in the apocryphal literature, and that's another uh, piece of scriptural information that the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church think is Scripture that is different from what we call pseudepigraphal literature, which is the book of Enoch, the Assumption of Moses, uh, the, the Gospel of Paul or Peter. So there's all kinds of different books and literature out there purporting to be Scripture that are not. What we have in our Bible, the 66 books, we believe are Scripture and these other books are not. That's not to say that there isn't some information in these other books that is of value, that uh, is something that you could read about just for knowledge or history, but uh, to use it as doctrinal information or anything like that, uh, that's a bridge too far. And, and I say that because uh, some will say, well, the book of Enoch has the, the name Azazel in it. And I, I do agree. When you look at the first book of Enoch, you find the name Azazel in it in reference to a demonic angel or a, a fallen angel. And that is interesting because I heard a Church of God minister, not in this church, say that that word only developed in the Middle Ages. And that is not true. That word goes back farther than the Middle Ages because the first book of Enoch, the time frame of it, is probably the 300s B.C. So that name goes farther back, and that's a different subject for another time. But there is some information that's valuable in these books, but most of it is spurious, and I want to begin to talk about it. Now, I told you Enoch, the first one which I'll be focusing on today, was probably written between about 300 B.C., and 160 A.D. Now keep that time frame in mind because it'll be important when we see what is actually written in this particular book. We have some complete manuscripts of this book from about the 15th or 16th century A.D. in the Ethiopic language or Gez as it's called. And the reason I mention that is the Ethiopic church, the Christian church in Ethiopia, does have the book of Enoch as one of its books of its Bible. Again, they're the only part of the Christian church that believes the book of Enoch should be in the Bible. Uh, all the other elements of Christianity do not. Now that particular book, First Enoch, was probably written in Aramaic, and there are some pieces of it that were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, so definitely it goes back to that 300 B.C. range. Now, it was written in three parts, so there's three pieces to this book. It's a compilation, and the oldest part 
is around 300 BC, but there are a couple other pieces of the book. It was compiled, someone put it together, that go maybe into the early 100s AD. Again, all of this is debated among scholars. The second book of Enoch was called the Book of the Secrets of Enoch. It's sometimes called Slavonic Enoch because our best manuscripts are in the Slavonic language. Once again, this book is kind of a retelling of the first book of Enoch, similar to how the Gospel accounts give you a different take on the same story of Jesus' ministry. The book of 2 Enoch gives you another take on what the book of 1 Enoch gets into. And I'll get into that a little bit later. 2 Enoch is probably written around the 1st century A.D. And again, how do they know this? How do they figure it out? By looking at the internal evidence within the book. So again, scholarship does a good job at determining that, and that's a whole other discussion. The third book of Enoch, yes, there are three books of Enoch, is sometimes called the Book of Palaces or Hebrew Enoch. And the reason it's called Hebrew Enoch is it's, it's written in a genre of writing that was done by rabbis or mystic Jews. And it was written about the 5th or 6th century A.D. in Hebrew. And in this genre of writing, the Jews would write about these rabbis who would go on these mystical journeys. And a, fa a famous rabbi in 3rd Enoch goes on a mystical journey into heaven and he meets, he meets their Enoch and Enoch has been transformed into a powerful angel and get what his name is. He's called Metatron now. Okay, so Enoch is transformed into an angel called Metatron, and he's second in rank to God in heaven now. So think about the heretical nature of that. Now, you might be wondering, who could write something like that? But think about it. The Jews were looking for a Messiah. They did not believe in Christ. So as the story of Jesus begins to move out in the world, 5th or 6th century A.D., Jews are trying to fight against that message, and they want people to think somebody else is the Messiah. And again, they focus on this mysterious figure in their scripture known as Enoch. But I started thinking of uh, King Kong and Godzilla movies when I was a kid, because there was a movie where Godzilla fought mega, mega something Godzilla, or whatever it was, and it made me think of this name, Metatron, which is uh, very interesting. Okay, enough of that. Uh, now what I'm going to do uh, is get into the book of First Enoch. That's my focus today because we're going to do a program on this tomorrow and this is going to be one of the offerings for it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about First Enoch. Now I have a copy of it here, but here's the thing I learned in my research. There are other copies and manuscripts of First Enoch. So if I'm quoting a, a, a verse or a scripture in First Enoch, I'm not going to do a lot of that today because it depends on which translation or manuscript you get, whether or not I'm going to be giving you the correct uh, chapter and verse. So just keep that in mind because there are different manuscripts out there. The people who translated this were using different manuscripts to come up with their translation. Now the differences are not major, just like with the Bible. But there are some little nuanced differences that can really make the text of Enoch really outrageous or just a little bit outrageous. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit of that as I go along. But let me begin with probably the biggest and most familiar controversy that the book of First Enoch brings us. And I could do a whole sermon on this, but I'm not, because I need to get the other parts of First Enoch. But I'm going to begin over in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Because the big deal in First Enoch 
is it brings us the backstory, or should I say the supposed backstory, to what we read in Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4. So let me read that to you from the Bible. Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Now notice what the context is here in verse 1. Men, right? That's the context. Okay, get that in your mind. Verse 2, that the sons of God... Okay, interesting language there, sons of God. Why, why is it using that language? We're not going to get into a, a lot of detail, but we'll get into a little. Saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Verse 3, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man... Again, what is the context here? He's talking about man. He's talking about men. You see that repeated in each of these verses. Verse uh, 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children to them, the same became, what did they become? Mighty men, were, which were of old men of renown. What did they become? Mighty men, men of renown. Okay, does it say that they are 500 foot giants or mile high giants? Okay, no, they're mighty men. Men of renown. Now, you, I gave a little bit away there. What does the book of First Enoch say these people became? Giants. But how big does the book of Enoch say they became? It depends on the translation. The shorter translation is here, 500 feet tall. The other translation says almost a mile high. Now, now just think about that for a minute. Just think about that for a minute. We found dinosaur bones all over the world. I believe dinosaurs were here on the earth long ago before Adam and Eve, okay? But folks, who has found the bones of 500 foot tall giants? Nobody's found them bones, okay? Them bones aren't out there, folks, because these giants never were on the earth. Understand what we're reading in this book. This is baloney, folks. Some people, I'm going to be honest, okay? Some people are getting into it. And I, I wonder, wait a minute, if it says there were 500 foot tall giants, how can you believe anything in that book, okay? So again, I caution people who are looking into this type of of literature. Now, let's go back to this phrase, sons of God, because some you, you'll get on the internet and you'll see all kinds of information about this, and there are a lot of Christians who do believe that demons uh, copulated with human women and, and did something and uh, caused some, some things that are going on out there. And I'm not going to get into all that. That's a whole other discussion. But this phrase, sons of God, don't get too thrown by it. In the book of Job, and let me just go to one verse, over in Job chapter 1 and verse 6, just so you get the other side of things a little bit, like why are people going off on this particular subject? In Job chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. You will find sons of God used in Job 2, verse 1. You will find sons of God used in Job 38, verse 7. And the context is that the sons of God being referred to here are angels. Okay, so what people do is they then say, well, if sons of God means angels in Job, then sons of God has to mean angels in Genesis. No, it doesn't have to mean angels in Genesis. Why? 
Because in other parts of the Old Testament, sons of God refer to men. Let me go to Hosea. Let's turn over to Hosea chapter 1, chapter 1, and verse 10. And again, the phraseology in Hebrew is a little bit different, but the, the meaning is the same. <laughs> Hosea chapter 1 and verse 10, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. You can go over to Hosea 11, verse 1, and we can read this. When Israel was a child, when I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So there's no doubt in the Old Testament the scripture in Hosea, God calls men, okay, sons of God. Now, just because that phrase in Genesis is similar to a phrase in Job, remember, the writer of Job was different than the writer of Genesis. Sons of God can mean men, and for further verification of my opinion, let's go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, and verse 5, and this one, uh, th this is pretty, pretty good one for this discussion. Hebrews 1, 5. Listen to what God says about angels. Hebrews 1, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Hebrews is telling me God is saying angels are not his sons, okay? And people will argue, well, it means not his sons like humans are his sons. Hey, we can, we can argue all these things and debate these things. My point of contention here is just because it says sons of God in Genesis and angels are referred to as sons of God in Job, you don't put two and two together there and make four. You've got to look at all these other things to understand this. And there are plenty of um, internet uh, ministers out there who explain Genesis 6 succinctly and clearly from the perspective that it's just talking about men in a different way when it says sons of God versus daughters of men. I don't have time to get into all that today because that's not the purpose of my sermon. But the purpose of my sermon is to show that this idea of angelic beings having sex with women and creating a, a race of giants is preposterous. It's preposterous. And a lot of people have taken that story, the white Christian identity movement, uh, other elements of Christianity, have taken that story and created heresies with it. This idea that demonic beings are copulating with human women. Again, think about that and also remember what Christ says in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 22 as kind of a coup de gras on this idea that something like that could occur. In Matthew 22, when he's asked about who someone's going to be married to in the kingdom, in, in the resurrection time frame when we are spirit beings, he says in Matthew 22, verses 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And you'll read commentaries that say the point he's trying to make here is that there's no sex with, with angels or the spirit world. Okay, it's a completely different uh, form of um, being. And uh, it, it, if angels can't do that, that, that that's what this is saying. Is it, and so there's a problem with what the book of Enoch is saying and this idea that has been promulgated continuously 
in Christian circles all these years uh, from the time this particular book was written. Now, again, I wanted you to remember when I said this book was written. I said around 300 B.C. This, and this story about angels copulating with human women. Think about 300 B.C. in history and scratch your head a little bit and think, were there stories like this in human history? Now, I'm Greek, okay? And I know about these stories because of Greek mythology, which predates the time of the book of Enoch by about 500 or 600 years. In about 900 B.C., 800 B.C., we have these stories of Zeus and Poseidon mating with human women, the Greek gods, mating with human women and producing Hercules and various other individuals, Helen of Troy, human individuals, some people thought, okay, or half human, half divine, okay, depending upon how you were looking at this. But this, this, this type of thing went on before the book of First Enoch. What do you, where do you think this guy got the story? Remember what's happening in the 300s B.C. The Greek philosophies, the Greek stories are permeating the entire Roman world and influencing it to the nth degree. Now again, I'm sorry about that because I'm Greek, okay? <laughs> but, but again, the point I'm trying to make is this guy, whoever wrote the book of Enoch, wasn't making up these ideas out of thin air. They had these stories, they knew these stories, and they were repackaging them for their own purposes. The reason they would use a man like Enoch to say Enoch wrote this book is because of the mystery behind Enoch in the Bible. If you look back at Genesis 5, Enoch is translated. Enoch is taken by God. People always wondered, what does that mean? Where did he go? And they used that figure, since he was righteous and he was a good dude, they used that individual to try to get people interested in reading their literature. They wanted to influence people. And let me put this out there too. Who else is trying to influence people and has influenced people since the beginning? You know who it is. Satan the devil. He is trying to get people away from God's message and God's word. And he's going to use every tool in his toolbox to do it. I believe this is one of his tools. Now, let's get to another aspect in the book of Enoch. Let's talk a little bit about hell. Oh, yeah, the book of Enoch talks about hell. And it's the real hell. I should put that in quotes. What I mean by the real hell is the hell where people were burning and getting tortured and all of that sort of thing. That hell is not in your Bible, but it's in the book of 1 Enoch and 2 Enoch, and it gives you the gruesome details of people getting tortured by these angels in these flames. There are flames, and some of the book of Enoch tells you they went to, Enoch went to a mountain with this angel, and they looked down into this mountain, and they saw the flames rising up, and that was this hell that everybody was talking about. There are other parts of the book of Enoch that get into the details of a separation between some of the spirits in hell and, and the good spirits are over here somewhere, okay? And the spirits in hell are screaming up to heaven and saying all kinds of things, okay? Again, this isn't in your Bible. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus was a story used by rabbis who were beginning to be influenced by these Greek ideas. Jesus used stories just as a story to get across a point. He didn't believe that was reality, just like he didn't believe other aspects of his parables were reality, where he... He, he seems to give props 
to a, a shady business guy. Of course Jesus would not give props to a shady business guy. He's trying to address a point in that parable that doesn't have to do with what some people say he may be saying about it. So again, these ideas were permeating the Christian world through the Greek thinking that was out there, and this concept of hell was there, that spirits go into it. The Bible is clear. I'm speaking to the choir here. You know when you die, you're asleep. You are not awake. You are unconscious. From the Old Testament through the New Testament, that is there over and over and over. But let me just give you one verse or two from this first book of Enoch. And I'm going to chapter 9, verse 10, but again, depending upon your translation, uh, you may get this in chapter 10 in a different verse. And just listen to what it says. And now behold, the souls of those who are dead cry out and complain even to the gate of heaven. Their groaning ascends, nor can they escape from the unrighteousness which is committed on earth. Again, talking about spirits of dead people groaning and complaining in whatever state they are living in. Your Bible says over and over and over again, the dead sleep. There is no remembrance in death. There is no understanding until a future resurrection, one of two, when people come back to a conscious existence once again. Again, Plato, the philosopher, writing in the 400s B.C., he talked all about this type of thing, okay? He had stories about people dying and going off into Hades and uh, talking to each other and having conversations. He has people going to heaven in a conscious state. That's all platonic, and it all comes before this book was written. Same type of information, same type of stories. It was permeating the entire Roman world at this particular time. Now, here, here's a pretty wild one. Now, in the Ethiopic translations, they've taken out a certain word from some of the uh, manuscripts of Enoch. And this is why. In the book of Enoch... In the Greek, the Greek uh, translations, the word sirens was in there. Now, does anybody know what a siren is in Greek mythology? There, there's no other siren except maybe a police siren, okay? But when you think of what a siren is, what the book of Enoch says is that these women who had sex with the bad angels they eventually turned into sirens. Now, what is a siren? In Greek mythology, it was a half-female, half-bird-like creature that would sing beautifully and lead men astray. Okay, if you rem I remember when I was a kid, there was this movie called Jason and the Argonauts. I don't know if anybody saw it, but okay, so, so what happens in the movie, you know, they're going along the coast somewhere, I don't know, somewhere along the coast of Greece, and uh, there's going to be some sirens coming up around the bend. So they tell Jason, we got we to gotta, uh, tie you to the mast because the, the, uh, the sirens are just going to, uh, you're going to want to be with the sirens and they're going to run us in, uh, aground and our ship's going to wreck. So they tie Jason to this mast. And I forget what, what the other guy, I think they plugged their ears or something so they didn't hear the sirens. And so these women are wailing and singing at them as they come around the bend and, and they were able to escape the sirens. But folks, this is Greek mythology. Listen to me. This is Greek mythology is in here. We can prove it. There's no doubt about it. And we're saying this is scriptural? Come on. Come on. The Ethiopians were right to get that out of their manuscript, okay? They knew what the deal was. They said people aren't going to believe this if we have sirens in there. So they removed it from their Ethiopian translations of this book. You see what's going on here? 
People were playing games. There's a conspiracy afoot here, folks, to get people to believe in the wrong thing. So sirens, okay? Now, let me get the water. Okay, let me talk a little bit about water. Uh, as I take a little sip right now, <laughs> I brought some water. How about that for uh, using my, uh, my tools here and my, uh, speaking? Uh, so here's the deal with water. I'm going to read you an interesting scripture from the book of Enoch. And uh, this is the Lawrence translation. And I'm going to go to Enoch 53 verse 9. And listen, I could, I could be up here for a few hours with all the information here, but I'm hitting the highlights. Uh, Enoch 53 verse 9. Now just listen to this and try to understand it. The, the water which is above heaven shall be the male, and the water which is under the earth shall be the female, and all shall be destroyed who dwell upon earth and who dwell under the extremities of heaven. The water above is going to be male, and the water below is going to be female. I can't make heads or tails of how to understand that unless... <laughs> Unless you go back to Greek mythology once again. And here's the thing in Greek mythology. The Greeks believed that the bodies of water on the ground, lakes and ponds and rivers, were female. That the nymphs and the sirens and the nereids, these feminine spirits, lived in the bodies of water on the earth. But what did they think of the heavens? They believed that the heavens, the clouds, the rain, the thunder, they associated those things up above with male deities. So that's why the writer is saying the waters above are male and the waters below are female. It's coming from Greek mythology again. Again, remember when this book was written. Now, probably one of the big issues with the book of Enoch is there are people, depending upon your translation again, because some of these translations have been altered, but some say, as this one writer says, the book of Enoch debunked, by Jim Garton, he suggests that in the original manuscript of Enoch, what it is telling us in 1 Enoch is Enoch is the Messiah. Enoch is the Messiah. Remember again when this was written, before Jesus Christ comes along. Plenty of Jewish people around at that time are looking for their Messiah. Now, what information do we have that can confirm this. Well, here's what we have. When you read the book of First Enoch, there are parts of it where Enoch seems to be an individual who's higher than any other human individual. And remember, the Bible makes it clear that Enoch is just a human. Okay, if we go to Hebrews 11, for those who think Enoch was special when he went to heaven and he didn't die... I want to turn you over to Hebrews 11 for a moment. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Now, in this chapter 11 of Hebrews, it's talking about all these individuals, these patriarchs who were men of faith in the Old Testament. And it lists them in chapter 11. It mentions Enoch right here, Enoch 11, 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But if you drop down to verse 13, same chapter, notice what it says. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Now, I did a sermon on Enoch and Elijah, where are they? So please get that, because I don't have time to get into all the details to explain this translation thing here. But what we believe about the translation, he was definitely moved to somewhere else upon the earth 
okay? Just like Elijah was moved somewhere else upon the earth by God when he was taken up into the fiery chariot. That's why the people said, let's go find Elijah over that hill. And Elisha says, no, it's okay, don't worry about it. They thought he was over the hill because he was somewhere else because a letter comes from Elijah later to a king after the time of Elijah going into heaven, which is a, makes it a fact that he was still on the earth somewhere. But that's the point I want to make is Enoch was just like every other man in the sense that he died. He died like every other man, and he's waiting for a resurrection. These people are trying to make him into some Messiah figure to prove to people that they should believe in something else other than the true Messiah. Now watch this. In this book of Enoch, and I don't have time to get into all of this right now, what they do with Enoch is they, the, an angel takes him up to heaven and he says to him, hey, I want you to see the books of all the history of the world and everything that's happened and everything that's going to happen. And he says, I want you to take it all in, Enoch. I want you to remember all this. And so Enoch looks at all the books, and then Enoch says, I got it all. I got all this information from the beginning of time through history. I now have it all in my mind. What's that saying about Enoch? That he's like God. He's omniscient, okay? He's got it all down pat. That's what it's pushing in the book of First Enoch. Why? Why is it pushing that? Why is it calling him the son of man in this book? Because it's pushing an agenda to say that he is the Messiah. And that definitely goes against what your Bible says. Now, something else that is said in the book of Enoch is Enoch becomes a liaison for God between what God wants to give... When God wants to give messages to the fallen angels, he tells Enoch to go deliver the message. Once again, folks, think about that. That doesn't make sense when you think about the Bible. And it says this, that Enoch can go in and see God in heaven. He actually goes in and sees God in heaven. Now, it says, and it says this, even the angels can't do that. It says that in the book of 1 Enoch. What does your Bible say? Let's go to Matthew 18 and verse 10. Does the Bible say angels can't see God face to face as the book of 1 Enoch does? Matthew 18 and verse 10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So the book of Enoch is blatantly contradicting what we say is scripture here in the Gospel of Matthew. Now again, the writer of 1 Enoch didn't know that Matthew was going to be scripture in the future, but it contradicts what this particular writer is saying about the abilities of angels in heaven. Now let me just read an excerpt from Garton's book here. I'm going to turn over to page 94. Just read a little excerpt. Who is the son of man and elect one in the book of Enoch? Many may be surprised to learn that the book of Enoch promotes Enoch as God's Messiah, the Son of Man, anointed one, and elect one, seated on the throne of glory, is Enoch. The writers of the book of Enoch hijacked the reputation and good name of an ancient patriarch, Enoch, to, keep, to give validity to their false Messiah figure. Perhaps frustrated for the Jewish Messiah to appear, the multiple writers of whatever Jewish cult decided to create their own Messiah, and they called their Messiah Enoch. The book of Enoch is the book of Revelation of Enoch, like the book of Revelation is the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, one other segment I want to read here. This is important to understand how people have messed with the translation. In chapter 71 of the book of Enoch, the Son of Man is revealed. Who is the Son of Man? In the 1893 R.H. Charles edition, it reads like this, And he, the angel, came to me, Enoch, 
and greeted me with his voice and said to me, Thou art the Son of Man, who art born unto righteousness, and righteousness abides over thee, and the righteousness of the head of days forsakes thee not. And he said unto me, His word for thee is peace in the name of the world to come. Again, think about what Jesus' name is, okay? For from thence proceeds peace since the creation of the world, and so will be with thee forever and ever and ever. And all who in time to come walk in thy ways, thou whom righteousness never forsaketh, their dwelling places will be with thee, and their heritage will be with thee, and they will not be separated from thee forever and ever and ever. And so there will be length of days with that Son of Man, and the righteous will have peace, and the righteous his path in the name of the Lord of spirits forever and ever and ever. Again, it uses this phraseology throughout the book, Lord, the Lord of spirits, the Lord of spirits. Your Bible doesn't use that kind of phraseology for God. So, and, and here's one final thing I want to say. In plain English, the angel said to Enoch, you are the son of man that is born to righteousness, and righteousness dwells over you. This is what R.H. Charles originally wrote in 1893, which clearly pointed to Enoch being the son of man. Charles also confirmed in a footnote that 7114 of Enoch proclaimed Enoch as the son of man. The footnote reads, Thou art the son of man who art born unto righteousness, and righteousness abides over thee, is an application to Enoch of the words used of the Son of Man. Unfortunately, in his 1912 edition, Charles changed the wording of chapter 71 without any textual or historical support. Charles did this after he was influenced by unsubstantiated conjecture put forth by a German scholar named Heinrich Appel. Many scholars understandably had a problem with the fact that Enoch 71.14 said Enoch is the Son of Man, or the Messiah. Heinrich Appel said, this is very striking phenomenon that Enoch here is the Messiah, should have made the interpreter startled. Most scholars were startled, as Appel put it, but instead of allowing Enoch 71.14 to read the way it was originally written, many of these scholars like Charles meddled with the text and rewrote it to imply 71.14 pointed to Jesus. This is precisely what Charles did in his 1912 translation. So again, folks, people are messing with this text, creating a different translation that is now being read by people who are thinking the Son of Man in the book of Enoch is Jesus, and they're thinking, okay, that that fits with the Bible, when originally it was saying the Son of Man was Enoch, who is not the Messiah. He's not the true Son of Man that we understand. Now, what does your Bible say about this type of thing? In Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying I am Christ. Christ is, folks, and that is definitely happening all over the place. But also I want you to turn to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 4. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 4. 4, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now what fables was he writing about? He was writing about Jewish fables like the book of First Enoch. This is first century Christian, Christianity writing here about Jewish fables that were extant at that time. One of them is the book of Enoch, which would have been known at this particular time in history. Now, 
What I'd like to do in my remaining time, some people say, well, wait a minute, Mike, wait a minute. The book of Enoch is quoted in the Bible. The book of Enoch is quoted. Now, if the book of Enoch was quoted in the Bible, that, that would be serious. We, we need to figure out something here, but wait a minute. Let's see what they're talking about. Let's look at this slowly and deliberately, okay? Let's pretend we're in college and, and we're lecturing and we're talking about this. Jude chapter, there's only one chapter in Jude. I love that about Jude. You know, it's only got one chapter, okay? So let's go to Jude 14. Jude 14. Listen carefully to what it says. And Enoch... Also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all, some say convict, to convince all or convict all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And people will say, Mike, there you go. The Bible's quoting the book of Enoch. But wait a minute. There are other segments in places in the Bible where it says, and thus it was written in the book of Jasher, and so it was written in this book, and this particular philosopher said that. And what does it say here? It says, And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesy. Is this quoting from the book of Enoch? No. It's not saying, And the book of Enoch 1 says, That's different from what we're reading here. It's talking about some prophecy of Enoch. Now remember, before they wrote things down, they had oral traditions. And these oral traditions went for years and years and years. Now, I want to show you what the book of Enoch says in Enoch 1 verse 9, at least in my translation. On the, it says almost the same thing as this. Almost. Listen to what it says. Here's the book of Enoch repeating what Jude 14 is saying, and, and behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh. And the rest is the same. But did you catch the difference? Enoch is saying he's coming to destroy all the ungodly Jude is saying he's coming to convince or convict all that are ungodly. Because what happens when the Messiah comes back? There's still going to be people on the earth alive. The book of Enoch seems to be implying that when that Messiah figure comes back, he's going to destroy all the ungodly upon the earth. That's not what your Bible is saying. That's not what your Bible is saying. So there's a big problem right there. Now, let's get into this idea that Enoch is quoting uh, from, uh, that they're quoting the book of Enoch here. When you go into 1 Enoch 1 and verse 4, it talks about, again, that's leading up to what we just read in Jude and the first book of Enoch, verse 9. Enoch 1.4 says that this Messiah figure is coming to Mount Sinai. But what does Zechariah tell us in Zechariah 14.4? He tells us the Messiah is coming to the Mount of Olives. Okay? Now again, think about the history here. When was first Enoch written? Before... Uh, the New Testament was put together before most of our Old Testament prophets were, were confirmed and, and put together. He may have been able to read, he may have been able to read Zechariah, but what's a more familiar story? 
the more familiar story to everyone is Moses in the Exodus, okay? So maybe this guy, there weren't libraries like there are today. Maybe this guy only knew about the Exodus story in Mount Sinai, and maybe he hadn't read Zechariah's prophecy. It wasn't out there like it is today. Again, why is he making this change here in where the Messiah figure is going to show up? Uh, 1 Enoch 1.6 and 1.7, uh, depending on the translation, says that all are going to perish on the earth. But the Bible, again, doesn't say that. Everybody doesn't perish when the Messiah comes back. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of dead people, no doubt about it, but not everyone. Again, differences here between the two. Now, again, to give you a little information about this oral tradition, let me just go to Genesis 50 and verse 24. Remember, we believe Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Again, we can debate that, but that's a belief that's out there. And in, in Genesis 50 and verse 24, notice what it says here. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land, unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from thence. So Joseph died being 110. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now what happens in Exodus 13, 19? Notice again. Remember, Joseph didn't write that down, folks. Okay? We got that written down later. We believe Moses may have written that down, but where's he getting the information to write that down? Uh, notice uh, Exodus 13, 19. Exodus 13, 19. Here's what we read in Exodus 13, 19. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you. Now, where's Moses getting this information that Joseph said this? He's getting it from oral tradition is what we believe, okay? That oral tradition went 400-some years here, okay? Down to this time before he writes this down. That is one particular scholarly look at this. Again, there are other, there are other views on that. But the point I'm trying to make is oral tradition was a big deal. The Pharisees, when they came back from the Babylonian captivity, you know, we're talking 500s B.C., they continued to create new laws and new ideas down to the first century. That's what Jesus was arguing with them about. For 500 years, they orally transmitted this stuff. It wasn't written down till later. They didn't write that stuff down till later. Do you understand how different the world was back then? These oral stories were passed for, for generations of time. So when we have a quote from Jude about what Enoch prophesied, there could have been an oral tradition about that from way back that was known by people. Okay, Again, not written down, so we aren't going to know about it. But the oral traditions were a big deal back then. So let me go to one other thing as I wind up here. Jude 1, verse 6. This is another argument that some make that, uh, that uh, the, the book of Enoch should be valid. In Jude 6, it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. And in 2 Peter 2, 4, we have a similar type of uh, a scripture there. Let me go to 2 Peter 2, 4 and read what it says there. But, but re re remember what it's not saying here in these verses. 2 Peter 2, 4 says this, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Now the Greek word there is tartaru. The Greek word is Tartaru, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment. Now again, this Greek word Tartaru, some people think, oh, that means, that means hell like pitchforks and fire and all that kind of thing. No, it doesn't. There were Greeks who thought that way, but that doesn't mean that that's what this word means in all, in all cases. Just like the Greek word for Hades. The Greek word for Hades can mean grave. There were Greeks who believed in a hell-like place, 
But not all, not all Jews believe that. So when you translate this word, Sheol, into the Greek language, the best word you have available is Hades, which also means the grave. Okay, Just because Plato had ideas of what happened in the grave doesn't mean that Plato is correct. He can't capture that word and control it. Okay, The grave can mean the grave also, as the Jews believed it. The same thing with the word Tartaro. But the, in each of these scriptures in Peter and in Jude, they are taking scriptures like the following. Go back to Psalm 107 with me. Psalm 107. What does the Bible say about when people are spiritually imprisoned in some way? Notice Psalm 107. Psalm 107, verse 10. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. The psalm here is writing about people who go away from God. And it's using the same language as Jude is using about those, those angels, as Peter is using about those angels. That once you go away from God, you are chained in darkness in a sense. You're an imprisoned in a sense. This is talking about men. Men, okay? So angels aren't confined in a fiery furnace somewhere. They are confined spiritually in a sense, mentally in a, in a sense, from what they have done and gone against God. Isaiah 42, 7 does the same thing, uses the same type of language, speaking about when men or anyone goes against God. Look at what it says, Isaiah 42, 7. To open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Remember what the false angels did. They went against God. So now they are spiritually imprisoned themselves. Just like humans, when we go against God, we're in a spiritual prison. We're in darkness without God. And finally, one other scripture, Isaiah 49.9, repeats the same terminology as you find in Jude, as you find in Peter, so you can better understand those scriptures. Isaiah 49, verse 9, "...that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth." To them that are in darkness, shew yourselves. They shall feed in the ways and their pasture shall be in all the high places. So folks, let me just reiterate. This book of First Enoch is not scripture. In fact, it's dangerous to start thinking that it is scripture. And I'm here to warn people about it, okay? Watch what you're getting into out there. Because there's deception. There is a force out there that's trying to lead us astray every which way it, it can, and we need to be on our, our P's and Q's to make sure we are not deceived. Thanks, Mike. Well, brethren, if you grab your hymnals and rise, we'll close out services on page 92. We'll sing the lower lights, page 92, and after which we'll have a closing prayer by Mr. Jeff Flanick.
brother. Now for the closing prayer. Merciful, eternal Father, thank you for the message today. Please help us to absorb it, to understand it, to always be on guard against deception, to continually study and meditate on your word, on your truth, to learn from our great teacher, your son. We ask these things in his holy name, Yeshua Messiah. Amen. Amen.